Hi, this is Tom from zerdefinals.com. I wanted to make a video about hyponatremia, and hyponatremia is a low concentration of sodium in the blood. And just remember, sodium in Latin is natrium, which is why we call it natremia. The normal range for sodium is between 136 to 145 millimoles per litre. And hyponatremia is anything below 136 millimoles per litre, and severe hyponatremia is below 120 millimoles per litre. Symptoms can vary from completely asymptomatic to a bit of lethargy, headaches, some dizziness, and as it gets more severe, you can develop postural hypotension, which is where you stand up and your blood pressure drops, ataxia, which is changes in balance and coordination, and even more severe changes like confusion, psychosis, seizures, and even comas. Firstly, we need to go through some basic physiology to get an understanding of how sodium is regulated and why it's important. The first thing to talk about is a concept called osmolality and osmolarity. And osmolality is technically the number of osmoles of a solute in a kilogram of solvent. And osmolarity is the number of osmoles of a solute in a liter of solution. So this is a very subtle technical difference, but it doesn't really matter in everyday practice. When we talk about plasma osmolality or osmolarity, we're basically talking about the concentration of solutes, which are dissolved substances, in the blood. The formula for calculating osmolarity is this. 2 times sodium plus glucose plus urea, all measured in millimoles per litre. And osmolarity is important because it controls the distribution of fluid in the body. Think of the fluid spaces in the body. You have the fluid inside the cells. This is called the intracellular compartment. Next, you have the fluid outside the cells. This is called the extracellular compartment. And the extracellular compartment can be broken down into the interstitial compartment, which is the fluid that sits around the cells and the intravascular compartment, which is the fluid inside the blood vessels. Water is free to move between these different compartments, and it moves in a process called osmosis. And this is where water molecules move from a place of low osmolality, a low concentration of solutes, to a place of high osmolality, a place of high concentration of solutes. For example, if there's more sodium in the blood, Water will move out of the cells and the interstitial fluid and flow into the blood. And if there's a lot of sodium in the cell, the water will flow out of the blood and the interstitial fluid and into the cells. And this way, the water movement balances out the osmolarity across the different spaces. Therefore, we know that if we measure the osmolarity of blood plasma, this is going to be roughly equal to the osmolarity of the cells. Next, let's look at the causes of hyponatremia. And in order to work these out, we need to understand what controls the concentration of sodium in the blood. There's four ways that sodium concentration can drop. If there's more water coming in, less water going out, less sodium coming in, or more sodium going out. And they're really the four ways that sodium levels can drop. So if you imagine this container, contains a fixed amount of sodium, the sodium concentration can be altered by the water going in. If you add water to it, then the sodium becomes more dilute, and as a result, you develop a hyponatremia, and we call this dilutional hyponatremia. This can be achieved by drinking more water, and we call this water intoxication, when too much water dilutes the blood and causes a dilutional hyponatremia. Another way to add water to it is by increasing the reabsorption of water in the kidneys. If you remember, a hormone called antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary gland acts on the collecting ducts in the kidneys to increase water reabsorption from the urine back into the blood. Therefore, if you add more antidiuretic hormone, more water is reabsorbed into the blood and the sodium concentration will become more dilute again. Usually, antidiuretic hormone 
is carefully controlled to balance the amount of water in the blood so that the person doesn't become too dehydrated or overhydrated and develops a hyponatremia. However, in a condition called Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone, or SIADH, too much ADH is released and too much water is reabsorbed in the kidneys and the concentration of sodium drops. The other way that the concentration of sodium can be altered is by how much sodium is in the body. Imagine the container contains a fixed amount of water. Inadequate sodium intake over time can cause hyponatremia. However, the body only really requires one millimole per kilo per day of sodium under normal conditions, which is relatively easy to achieve with a normal diet. For example, a one litre bag of saline contains 150 millimoles of sodium, which is more than enough for most adults. More commonly, excessive sodium loss is the cause of hyponatremia. And sodium can be lost through the kidneys, or it can be lost through other areas such as sweating, vomiting, diarrhea, or burns. It's quite straightforward to understand how sodium is lost through excessive sweating or excessive vomiting, diarrhea, etc. So let's look at how excess sodium is lost through the kidneys. There are two main ways that sodium is lost through the kidneys. Firstly, it can be a shortage of steroid hormones. And secondly, it can be through the use of medications such as diuretics. Now, if you remember your physiology, steroid hormones such as aldosterone and to a lesser extent cortisol cause sodium reabsorption and potassium excretion in the kidneys. In conditions like primary adrenal insufficiency or Addison's disease, there is a deficiency in these steroid hormones and this prevents adequate reabsorption of sodium in the kidneys. Loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics and potassium sparing diuretics all act to prevent sodium reabsorption and as a result these medications can all lead to hyponatremia. So how do you assess a patient with a low sodium to try and figure out what the cause is? The first thing you want to do is establish is that patient having a genuine hyponatremia? And you can do that by checking the serum osmolality. Now remember this equation because it's quite important. Calculated osmolarity equals two times sodium plus glucose plus urea. If the patient has a low sodium and their serum osmolality is low, you know this is a genuine hyponatremia. The low sodium is causing a low osmolality. If the patient has a low sodium but their osmolality is normal, we can call this a pseudo-hyponatremia. And this is where a high level of lipids, such as in hyperlipidemia, or proteins, such as in myeloma, take up a higher proportion of the blood volume and make the blood analyzer think that there's a low sodium when in fact, if you separate the lipids or proteins away from the plasma, the sodium concentration would be normal. If the patient has a low sodium but a high osmolality, this is usually caused by a very high level of glucose in a condition called hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, or HHS, which occurs in type 2 diabetics. The blood level of sugar goes up very high, for example, over 40 millimoles per litre and above. Glucose leaking into the urine causes water and sodium to follow. This results in a dehydration and further concentrates the amount of glucose in the blood. Having a high glucose level in this equation leads to a high osmolality, but the sodium might be normal or low. So let's say you check the serum osmolality and it's low, suggesting a genuine hyponatremia. The next thing you want to check is the person's fluid status. This involves checking whether they are dehydrated euvolemic or normally hydrated or edematous. A dehydrated patient with hyponatremia will have an inadequate amount of sodium. This is either through inadequate intake or more likely through excessive sodium loss. A euvolemic patient or normally hydrated patient will have an excessive amount of water diluting the sodium in the blood and causing a dilutional hyponatremia. This excessive water comes from either an increased intake through drinking or a reduced loss through the kidneys. An edematous patient is likely to have congestive cardiac failure or 
hypoalbuminemia secondary to a liver disease or nephrotic syndrome. So once you've checked the person's fluid status, the next thing is to look at the urine sodium or urine osmolality. This simply tells you whether the patient's cause of the hyponatremia is in the kidneys or is somewhere else. If the urine sodium or urine osmolality is high, you know the problem's in the kidneys. If the urine sodium or urine osmolality is low or normal, you know the problem is somewhere else because the urine osmolality is reflecting the osmolality of the blood, which means the kidneys are working normally. So let's run through the possible outcomes that you might have when a patient has hyponatremia. Let's say you assess them and they're dehydrated. As a result, you know they've lost sodium from somewhere. So you check the urine, sodium, and the urine osmolality. If these are high, because there's lots of sodium in the urine, you know that the person has lost sodium from the kidneys. So the possible causes are likely to include diuretics or adrenal insufficiency. If these are low, you know that the sodium is being lost from somewhere else. For example, sweating, diarrhea, vomiting, or burns. Now let's say you assess them and they're uvolemic. As a result, you know that there is a dilutional hyponatremia, meaning excessive water has been gained. You check the urine sodium and the urine osmolality. If this is high, you know that the urine is being concentrated by excessive reabsorption of water in the kidneys. Therefore, the patient has a syndrome of inappropriate ADH or SIADH. If this is low, you know that the water is gained through excessive consumption which is called water intoxication. Finally, if the patient is edematous, then it's likely that they have congestive cardiac failure or hypoalbuminemia, secondary to liver disease, nephrotic syndrome, or some inflammatory process. Conditions that cause edema, or fluid moving into the interstitial space, also cause a reduction in cardiac output. This causes a reduction in volume circulating to the brain and as a result, the hypothalamus releases ADH and causes more reabsorption from the kidneys and a subsequent dilutional hyponatremia. Mostly the way to treat hyponatremia is to treat the underlying cause. If it's caused by diuretics, you stop the diuretics. If it's adrenal insufficiency, you give the patient steroids. Where the patient is dehydrated and sodium is lost, you simply replace with sodium and fluids and where it's due to water intoxication, you restrict the patient's intake until their sodium returns back to normal. A condition that I want to talk a bit more about is SIADH. There's a huge number of causes of SIADH. It's worth remembering a few that will come up in exams and being aware that there's loads of other causes. The ones to remember are small cell lung cancer, as the tumor produces and releases ADH itself, other chest conditions such as atypical pneumonia, particularly Legionella pneumonia, brain damage affecting the hypothalamus, particularly due to meningitis or subarachnoid hemorrhage, and drugs such as carbamazepine and SSRIs. So how do you treat SIADH? Well, the first thing is to restrict the patient's fluid intake. This helps to concentrate their blood. The next thing to do is, if possible, treat the underlying cause. So if they have a pneumonia, you want to treat that pneumonia. Or if they're on SSRI medication, you, you might consider switching to a different medication. What they used to use is an antibiotic called demeclocycline, which happens to be an antagonist of ADH. But now that's been replaced by something called Vaptans. For example, Tolvaptan. And what these do is they're competitive ADH receptor antagonists. So they bind to the ADH receptor and prevent the antidiuretic hormone from attaching to that receptor and activating it. So they basically block the action of ADH. And these medications are very powerful, so it's important to use them very carefully because they can cause a very quick rise in the serum sodium, which can be dangerous. The final thing is just to mention a condition called central pontine myelinolysis. And this is a disorder that affects the brain when sodium is corrected too quickly. What happens is the myelin sheath of the nerve cells in the brain becomes damaged by the quick change in sodium. The osmotic balance in that myelin sheath becomes disrupted and it causes demyelination 
of the nerve cells. This can lead to all kinds of problems such as acute paralysis or problems with speech or swallowing. And to prevent this, we'd only try and correct the hyponatremia at a rate of less than 10 millimoles per litre over 24 hours. So you only want the sodium level to rise by 10 millimoles per litre every 24 hours. And if it exceeds this, you need to be very careful because you could be causing central pontine myelinolysis. So thanks for watching. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, don't forget there's plenty of other resources on the Zero to Finals website, including loads and loads of notes on various different topics that you might cover in medical school with specially made illustrations. There's also a whole test section where you can find loads of questions to test your knowledge and see where you're up to in preparation for your exams. There's also a blog where I share a lot of my ideas about a career in medicine and tips on how to have success as a doctor. And if you want to help me out on YouTube, you can always leave me a thumbs up, give me a comment or even subscribe to the channel so that you can find out when the next videos are coming out. So I'll see you again soon.